Hi. Hey, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to present today. And and uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you could join us uh, for the webinar today. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can. Uh, there we go. So, hey, everybody out there. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, address a question that I get asked a lot. Uh, and I wanted uh, this opportunity to kind of uh, just put in perspective uh, what is insertion loss and how much is too much. Um, I'll also uh, uh, mention a couple other uh, preliminary uh, comments about um, the, uh, what we're going to present today. I mean, this is a kind of a broad topic. Uh, there's a limited time. And so I just want to focus on this one very special question, kind of put it in perspective. But I'm also providing a lot of additional information available for you guys. And I, I list here on the, on the cover slide uh, a few other resources to check out. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, check out my new latest textbook on transmission lines. We'll go through a little bit of the details about the properties of signals on transmission lines, but don't really address this question of insertion loss directly there. But it gives you a lot of background about transmission lines, how to think about signals on interconnects. Um, in uh, my original textbook, Signal and Power Integrity Simplified, we cover insertion loss quite a bit, and there's additional details in there. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, I'll mention that um, uh, we, we um, have a whole bunch of different uh, webinars related to this topic on uh, bethesignal.com. Uh, and so you'll definitely want to check it out. And then um, I'm the technical editor of the um, Signal Integrity Journal. And that's also a great uh, free resource of additional information about this topic and other topics on signal integrity, power integrity, and EMI as well. Um, so I am actually part of Teledyne LaCroix, my own company, Bogotan Enterprises, where I used to do a lot of training around the world. We were acquired, gosh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm fully part of uh, Teledyne LaCroix. We manufacture scopes, and uh, part of my role is to provide some training for engineers. Historically, I've worked on best design principles, and now I work on or focus on best measurement principles. And I'll show you a couple of examples of, of both of those today. Now, as a uh, kind of a thank you for joining us today, um, courtesy of uh, Tell on the Crow, we've got a special offer for y'all. Uh, uh, I've collected all the classes that I used to do live, recorded them and put them on our new portal, the Signal Integrity Academy. And everybody viewing here uh, is gonna get a, a, a three month complimentary subscription to the Signal Integrity uh, Academy. And the way you do that is you go to be the signal.com, you'll pull down the tab that's a three month subscription, uh, you fill it out and here's the secret code word to add under promo code, you put web20. Uh, and that will get you um, a three-month uh, complimentary subscription. It's all you can eat buffet. You can view all of our content on uh, bethesignal.com. We've got about 200 hours of recorded video on different um, lectures and classes and presentations I've done on um, uh, all aspects of signal integrity, power integrity, and EMI. So be, for, be sure to, to check it out. Okay, so we're going to talk about insertion loss. And I thought I would just start out with a little bit about what exactly is insertion loss and why is it sometimes a really confusing topic? And so here's the fundamental definition of insertion loss. It's really characterizing uh, a device and to characterize the device and how, how much energy gets through the device, we first set it up with a transmitter on one side and a receiver on the other side. This is historically how insertion loss has always been measured. And when you set it up with the fixture, so it's the the transmitter and the receiver, you measure how much power comes through. That is your reference. That's telling you about the quality of the source and the receiver and the fixturing and the connections. That is your baseline. How much gets through with nothing in between, with no device center test in between. Then you pull apart the fixture and you insert your device, the through device. And now you measure the power that gets through. And we're really going to compare, you know, and of course, this is at each frequency, and we're really going to compare what happens to that power when you insert the device. And absolutely guaranteed, if it's a passive linear time invariant device, which is what all interconnects are, absolutely guaranteed, no matter what, you're always going to have less power coming through. That means you're going to have some loss in that power. And the definition of insertion loss is, it's how much power comes out without the device. That's the reference 
divided by the, um, uh, the, the power that comes out uh, with the device in, in place. And so the power that comes out without the device is always going to be larger than the power that's received that comes out uh, with the device in place. The power that comes through with the device is always going to be less. That means this ratio is always going to be greater than one. And so insertion loss is a positive number because that makes sense, right? Because we think of a loss as a positive thing. The bigger the loss, the less energy you have coming through, the more the attenuation, the more the loss in the system. Um, and so insertion loss, the original definition is it's the loss in the signal by inserting the device between the transmitter and the receiver. Um, and so if I have a larger insertion loss, then your sense is, oh, larger insertion loss, less signal is going to get through. I have more loss uh, from inserting that device in there. And so if you were to look at, for most materials, the attenuation of material increases with frequency. And so the loss, uh, kind of the energy that goes into, into heat, uh, is going to increase with frequency. And so we would see an insertion loss kind of looking like this. As we go up in frequency, the loss is going to increase. I get less signal coming through. Okay, that's how we think of insertion loss. It's very intuitive that way. A larger insertion loss, less signals coming through. I'm getting more loss in the interconnect. Uh, and so uh, what, what does it mean about the device? If the insertion loss is large, not as much as getting through. It's not as good, not as transparent and interconnected. There's a large insertion loss. Okay, now we talk about S parameters. Now we have to look at the same behavior, the same figure of merit characterization, but now in terms of S parameters. And everything I'm going to be talking about today applies directly to single-ended interconnects or differential interconnects, where we describe them as kind of mixed mode interconnects. So I'm not really going to make a distinction here today. Uh, are we talking about single-ended or, or differential uh, insertion loss uh, or S parameters? Behavior is exactly the same. But when we look at the definition of the S parameters, the the through path, the, the S21, if this is port one and this is port two, I send a signal from port one to port two, I look at how much comes through in port two, that's S21. The definition of that is, it's the opposite of insertion loss. It is the output signal divided by the input signal. That means the output is always gonna be less than the input. That means S21 is always gonna be less than one. And if we describe it in dB, it means a negative dB. And not only that, but if you have a worse interconnect, a less transparent interconnect, if there's more attenuation in the interconnect, what happens to S21? S21 gets smaller. And so a worse interconnect is a smaller S21. And if you describe S21 in dB, because it's always less than magnitude of one, in dB, one is zero, and in less than, than one is always a negative dB. That means S21 gets larger and larger, more negative, the larger and larger negative dB value. There's a connection between insertion loss and S21, but they're not the same. The connection is the insertion loss is the absolute value of S21 and dB. So you change the sign, and yeah, okay, that's insertion loss. So the more larger, more negative S21 becomes, the less signals going through, the absolute value, the, the larger that number is, the larger the insertion loss. So they're definitely related. One's the inverse of the other in magnitude or the change the sign to, to get from one to the other, but that sign difference. And, and so that means that insertion loss increases with frequency because of a worse material, more attenuation, but the the transmission coefficient S21 decreases with frequency. They're describing the same thing, but because of the definitions, they're opposite. It is incredibly confusing. Because when you talk about S21, if the if the insertion loss, or let's talk about insertion loss, insertion loss increases, um, what does that tell you about the interconnect? It's less transparent, right? Insertion loss is a bad thing. The larger insertion loss, the less energy goes through the more loss by inserting that device. But if you look at S21, um, if S21 increases, what is a, 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 an S21 in dB, what does it mean to increase? That means it's going up this way, it's getting less negative. And less negative means it's getting better, there's more transmitted. And so it's incredibly confusing.
Are you talking about insertion loss or are you talking about the transmission coefficient S21? And unfortunately, we get into this really bad habit, and I'm, guilt, I'm guiltier than most at this, of referring to S21 as insertion loss, when in fact, it's the opposite, it's the negative or the absolute value of insertion loss. And so when we look at S21, we just have to be aware of this confusion that when you see an S21 and it's labeled insertion loss, it's not insertion loss, it's transmission coefficient. As we go up in frequency, less gets transmitted, more loss. And so when I show you S21 plus, we talk about S21, think insertion loss, the uh, higher the frequency, the more the insertion loss. And we're gonna look at that question of how much is too much, but we're gonna measure it in terms of S21. And we look at it, they're both in dBs. The insertion loss is the positive dB value. The S21, the transmission coefficient is the negative dB value. So, uh, but I'm gonna try to be careful to refer to insertion loss, uh, getting larger is bad. Uh, transmission coefficient, uh, getting uh, smaller is good, getting more, or I'm sorry, getting more negative, getting, getting a smaller and smaller value of transmission coefficient is bad. Okay, here's an example of a transparent interconnect. So now we got uh, kind of um, uh, uh, calibrated a little bit. Um, if we have, here's S21, you can see it's a negative dB, so this is transmission coefficient. Think the positive value, and that's an insertion loss. So in either case, if you have zero dB, uh, then that says, okay, everything's going through, nothing's getting uh, attenuated, uh, nothing is blocked, transmission coefficient is one. And here's an example of what a transparent interconnect looks like. This happens to be a through connection path, this is measured in a uh, wave pulse, I'll show you some more data in a little bit. But if, if there's no attenuation and no losses, reflections are really small, everything gets through, and it's pretty darn close to um, zero dB in insertion loss or transmission coefficient. So yeah, we can make uh, really good uh, interconnects uh, like that. And I'm gonna show you a couple other examples of these uh, a little later. Um, okay, so given that perspective of insertion loss, that's the more insertion loss is bad, it's less transparent. Now we can look at, um, well, why do we care? What's the problem? And here's the fundamental problem. When we have a channel, so I've got a transmitter over here on the device, I've got a receiver over here on the IC. When we look at the signal coming out of that transmitter, here's an eye for what that signal looks like right at the transmitter. Beautiful, wonderful looking eye. But by the time it gets over here to the receiver, it looks like this. That along the way, that eye is getting seriously degraded. And it's all because of those gosh darn pesky interconnects. All those things that we're involved in designing and manufacturing. That's the problem. And, and it's all about, as we'll see, all about insertion loss. When we look at how come the eye looks like this at the receiver, when it looked like this at the transmitter, when we look at all those problems, we can group them into four general categories. Four general categories of how the interconnect causes that eye to collapse as it does. And I'm gonna give you the punchline. I'm gonna show you those four categories and we'll talk about the important one. So here is how come the the interconnect alone can cause a signal looking like this to the transmitter to look like this to the receiver. And it's all about affecting the received signal, which is how much gets transmitted, how much at the receiver, this is about insertion loss. So the first one is about the, the actual losses in the interconnect. And by losses, I literally mean the energy is turned into heat. That's where it's going. The second is, um, well, if it doesn't go through and come out, and if it doesn't go into heat, where else is it going? Well, one is, um, reflected back to the source. And if it's back to the source, I don't see it at the receiver, and so that contributes to loss at the receiver. The third mechanism is, well, if it doesn't come through, and if it doesn't go into heat, and if it doesn't reflect back, where else can it go? It can go into another channel. And so I can lose energy to coupling to another channel, uh, and, and, and that's gonna contribute to the insertion loss. Or, and this is, this is uh, another source of noise, is I can get energy coupled in from one other uh, channel into my victim channel, um, but generally they're uncorrelated and that noise appears everywhere throughout the eye and that will also collapse the eye. So two mechanisms by which noise affects the receive signal. One is I lose some energy into a, a coupling into an adjacent channel or I gain some uncorrelated energy 
um, back from the, an aggressor into that channel. And then the fourth mechanism, which is really special to differential pairs, the, the fourth mechanism uh, is um, from mode conversion. And this is basically, I send energy into the, uh, from the transmitter as a differential signal. My receiver is sensitive to differential signal and I lose energy, it doesn't go into heat, it doesn't reflect back, it's not coupling to some other channel, but it gets converted into the common signal in that channel. And generally the receivers are sensitive to the differential signal. And so if I've got some of the, the differential signal that got converted to different, uh, I'm sorry, if I got some of the differential signal that got converted to common signal, that differential signal is not there anymore to see it at the receiver. So we got these four different mechanisms by which energy will come out of the transmitter and I won't get it at the receiver. This is all contributing to insertion loss. Well, for today, the, these three other mechanisms, the reflection noise, the crosstalk, the mode conversion, those are solvable by design. I can engineer the physical interconnects to minimize reflections, keep the the discontinuity, or minimize the discontinuities. I can reduce the crosswalk, the coupling from one uh, uh, aggressor to a victim. And I can minimize mode conversion by keeping the symmetry between the, the signals. So these three I can manage by design. The first one up here, the losses, that's not so much about design, a little bit about design, but it's mostly about the material selection. And that's the one that I wanted to focus on today. I wanted to talk about what can we do in the uh, to, to reduce the insertion loss due to energy being turned into heat in the interconnect. And that's what we, we, we usually refer to as the losses in the interconnect. So let's take a quick look uh, at um, um, the, what contributes to the losses in the interconnect. Now, um, I, I'm gonna try an experiment here. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the questions that are being, um, uh, uh, typed in in the chat room and I'm going to try to answer them as we go. So if you've got a question, type it in. I'm going to try to pay attention and try to answer that. So I got one of the question is, uh, Nick is asking, uh, uh, is there a mathematical equation to re relate insertion loss to frequency? Insertion loss to piece? Yes, there is. Very simple approximation. Each of these, of course, are different mechanism. And you know, in fact, that, that brings us to the, the other uh, important point I want to make, which is you know, if we have a problem, our eye looks like this at the transmitter, beautiful, wonderful looking eye at the transmitter. It looks like this at the receiver. If we don't want that collapsed eye at the receiver, we want to open up that eye. That's our problem. It's collapsed. If that's our problem, how do you fix a problem? The number one most important thing you need to know is the root cause. And to kind of illustrate that, um, I've got a little example here. This is a um, a uh, little cartoon, a couple of cavemen here, they're watching this tar the pterodactyl just fly over here and, and one caveman is saying to the other guy standing here, he's saying, are you sure about this stand? It seems odd that a pointy head and a long beak is what makes them fly. If you have the wrong root cause for a problem, your chance of fixing that problem is based on pure luck. And so understanding the root cause, finding the root cause and understanding how the materials and design influences the root cause is the secret to, fi is the secret to fixing these problems. And so when, when we start with uh, eye looks like this at the transmitter and we end up like this at the, at the receiver, if we wanna fix that problem, we have to understand the root cause. And here literally are the four root causes to this problem. And, and we're gonna focus on one of them about the losses in the interconnect. Um, uh, let's see, does phase, I'm gonna address a couple of other, Mohammed is asking, does phase or group delay fluctuations matter for PSK signaling schemes? So um, this effect, the, the question is about the phase velocity or group, group velocity. So if you eliminate the reflection, so you have a uniform interconnect, so you don't have the reflection loss in signal, and, um, uh, and you look at typical kind of materials, there's a very small amount of dispersion that dispersion is the frequency dependence of the speed of the signal or the um, uh, gives, gives rise to uh, variation in the, in the phase velocity. Very small effect. I didn't even mention it here because it's so small compared to the one we're gonna talk about. And in general, 
the amount of dispersion, the frequency dependence to the speed of the signal, the phase velocity of the signal, that depends on the amount of loss, the dissipation factor of the material. And so we want to get, a, as we'll see in a minute, we want to get a low dissipation factor anyway, and that means low dispersion. So dispersion, not nearly a problem compared to the attenuation. Uh, when my main channel couples with the neighboring channels where I'm losing some energy to that neighbor, am I called victim or aggressor? Oh, okay. Good question. Nomenclature. So if I'm the, the, um, uh, the, the signal line over here, I'm going to illustrate this question. On the signal line over here, I'm sending a signal to my receiver and I'm losing energy from my channel and it's going to somebody else. I'm the aggressor, the other channel is the victim. And so I'm the one that's generating that signal. The victim is the one that's getting that ex excess noise. And I can also be a victim. I can have another channel over here driving a signal out and I can get some of his energy on me, then I'm the victim. Both of those problems will contribute to the collapse of the eye. And so I want to engineer my interconnects so I reduce that channel to channel crosstalk so I'm not losing energy to, as aggressor to a victim and I'm not gaining any noise from another aggressor as me as, as the victim. So good question. Um, okay, the jitter belong to which of these four? Oh, very good question. So Ali is asking the question about jitter. Hold that thought because I'm gonna show you how the losses in the interconnect affect jitter. Very important root cause. Now there are other sources of jitter in the system. I'm just looking at the impact from the interconnect that we have kind of control over the design of. There are other sources of jitter at the transmitter, at the receiver, and, um, and related to the clock data recovery. But I'm gonna show you how these losses can also create jitter. And we sometimes call that deterministic jitter. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, will the talk today apply to 25? Yeah, I'm going to show you an example of, so the question is, will it apply to 25 gig? Yeah, I'm going to show you an example of 28 gig in just a little bit. Uh, you get the slides. Yep, you get the slides. What 3D tools does your simulation perform? Yeah, this isn't simulation. This is measurement. I'm going to show you examples of that. What's the minimum stub that can be neglected? I'll address that later. Okay, so let's talk about losses and um, dominated by the the uh, losses in the circuit board, the interconnects. Okay, so here is where we look at this fundamental root cause. So I'm gonna take a simple case. Uh, I'm gonna take a um, uniform transmission line. I just drew this as a microscope because it's easy to draw and it identifies signal and return, but it, this analysis applies to every interconnect. I'm gonna send a signal in and we're gonna look in the frequency domain because it'll be easier to describe and then we'll see what the impact of that is in the time domain. Send a sine wave in. Of course, if it's a linear, passive, time invariant interconnect, we're gonna get exactly the same frequency coming out. We get one gigahertz going in, we're gonna see one gigahertz coming out. But the amplitude is gonna be reduced. And, and if we engineer the interconnect so that the, the source impedance and the receiver impedance matches the characteristic impedance of the line. So we don't have reflections, we don't have coupling out to another uh, another uh, uh, victim line, and we don't have mode conversion. So we've eliminated those other three problems. We still have some of that energy going into that interconnect. We're losing it by the time it comes out and it's going into heat. This is gonna be the case for 100% of all real materials. If we were to look at how the amplitude of that wave decreases as it goes down the interconnect, because here we're at one frequency, you know, some amplitude goes in, we get less amplitude coming out. How does that amplitude drop off as we go down the interconnect? We're going to see something like this. We're going to see the amplitude dropping off exponentially. We can describe it as a simple exponent power where the distance we go is in the exponent. This is how 100% of all real materials behave, homogeneous materials. The amplitude coming out drops as we go up in frequency. I'm sorry, drops as we go down the length of the interconnect. And so now we can describe the, uh, the transmission coefficient. Remember that was how much signal comes out compared to what goes in. And let's see, if we take this in dB, in other words, look at the transmission coefficient in dB, what's that? It's the ratio of what comes out, this guy here, divided by what goes in, this. So I'm gonna take this whole thing here, divide this out, I end up with this, and now to, to describe it in dB, I take that ratio, which is, ends up to be this, I take the log of that, which is just the exponent, 
I multiply that by 20, and look, I end up with this term here. This is the attenuation per length times the length. That is literally the definition of attenuation. This is how much energy we're losing due to heat. That energy, that amplitude that's, that's gone by the time it comes, it literally goes into heating up that um, uh, interconnect. And that's what we mean by the losses in the interconnect. It is the energy that goes into heat. And look, the, the transmission coefficient in dB is literally minus the attenuation. That means that the insertion loss is literally, it, when you eliminate the other three mechanisms, is literally the attenuation. That's why it is such a useful metric because it tells us about this very important metric. You eliminate the other three, all you're left with is the attenuation in the interconnect. And that turns out to be a huge problem. Here's, I wanna show you an example of it. Here is, um, I took a, an interconnect 20 inches long, had to fit it on my board, so I built a little meander for it. So this one happens to be a differential pair. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna address some of these other questions. Uh, how do we select the frequency range for extracting insertion return loss? I'm gonna show you that. Uh, for next and far end, how does transmit and receive location matter? Is it a function of signal flow direction? Yeah, I'm, in a, I'm not going to talk about near and far end crosstalk. Maybe another time I will. If you're interested in some of these other topics like stubs and near and far end crosstalk, hey, I invite you to visit the Signal Integrity Academy. You all get a complimentary subscription now. We get a lot of lectures on there about these topics, and it's all free for you now. So check out those topics. I wanted to focus really on just the losses in the interconnect. So here's our 20 inch long interconnect. We're going to send a differential signal in on one end and we're going to look at the differential signal on the other end. And I should do this measurement with one of our um, wave pulsers. It's an interconnect uh, uh, characterization tool. We're going to look at the insertion loss, everything else too, but I'm going to show you the insertion loss as a function of frequency. Now when we do that, that someone asked about well, what's the connection between the insertion loss and um, the, uh, is there an equation for it versus frequency? And so the insertion loss, that energy that goes into heat, the two mechanisms by which we lose energy is conductor loss, that's the, the series resistance of the traces, and dielectric loss, that's about the dissipation factor of the material. And here's the connection between the transmission coefficient and the dissipation factor of the material. And it, this simple derivation for it, I didn't want to um, spend time doing here. It again is uh, outlined in detail in some of the lectures on the SI Academy, but it's a really simple relationship. It says, okay, that transmission coefficient dB per inch, because remember it scales uh, with, with length. It depends on a constant here, the frequency in gigahertz, the dissipation factor of the material, squared of the dielectric constant. You put in the numbers for FR4, for dissipation of 0.02, square root of, of uh, four, it turns out to be about 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz. Really, really valuable figure of merit. This says it's gonna be linear with frequency, you know, in dB, linear with frequency, and it's gonna scale linearly with length as well. And sure enough, here is that measurement. So here is S21, transmission coefficient versus frequency. So remember, invert this, change the sign, and that becomes the insertion loss. As we go up in frequency, less signal comes through because of this frequency term. It's related to the motion of the dipoles. Those dipoles are gonna be rotating back and forth. The higher the frequency, the faster they rotate, the more the energy couples from the motion of the dipoles into um, uh, jiggling the rest of the backbone of the polymer, and the more friction and the more heat is generated. So it's linearly proportional to frequency. And look, here it is, drop it off. So the green is the measurement. And then I just drew this um, straight line on top of it just to show you, oh my gosh, it's pretty darn linear with frequency, exactly what this simple approximation predicts. This is when the loss is dominated by the dielectric loss. The line width is wide enough here I think it's like a 15 mil wide line, wide enough, yeah, 15 mil wide line, wide enough so that the conductor loss was small compared to the dielectric loss. And sure enough, increasing with frequency. And let's see, what's the figure of merit? What's the slope of that? Let's see, here is, I look at the straight line here. Here is minus 20 dB happening. It's 20 inches long, divided by 20 inches. And this happens at 10 gigahertz. And so what's that ratio? 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz. Darned if it isn't 
pretty much right on the nose of what our simple figure of merit is for FR4. So it says, hey, you know what? This is a really good figure of merit to describe the losses in the interconnect. The higher frequency I go, the more attenuation, the more insertion loss, the less transmitted signal that I'm gonna get. So this is a really simple way of thinking about the interconnect matches the behavior of real interconnects. And now we can address the question of, so what? Now, someone asked the question, uh, 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 Jadish is asking, after eight gigahertz, is the dielectric loss greater than conductor loss? In this particular example, the dielectric loss is always gonna increase with frequency, proportional to frequency, it's always gonna get bigger. The conductor loss is less contribution, doesn't increase as fast. So the total insertion loss is always dominated by dielectric loss in this example, because my line is so wide. And somebody's asking, um, I guess uh, uh, Jadish is asking, and, and Nick is maybe asking too, hey, wait a minute, I see the straight line and it's great, here we're up to eight gigahertz, but after eight gigahertz, hey, how come there's this deviation? How come you're getting more attenuation than we expected just for, from the, the dielectric loss? Okay, there's a more complicated behavior going on that I'm not showing you, which is I'm using really cheap SMA connectors and those SMA connectors have a cutoff at about 15, 16 gigahertz. And we're starting to see the impact of the reflected signal from those SMA connectors. And so this behavior here, remember we said, this is the loss if we take out the other three mechanisms. We don't have reflection, we don't have um, uh, coupling out, and we don't have uh, mode conversion. Well, in this case, I've got more and more reflected signal because of the crappy SMA connectors. Uh, and so that's why I'm losing energy here. But below that, the connectors are transparent, no impact. So that's the effect going on here. Um, okay, now comes the so what. The so what is, here's this frequency dependence. I've got higher frequency, I lose more energy. If I take a very fast edge, maybe it's part of a square wave. If I take a square wave, what are the frequency components of a square wave? The amplitude of the frequency components drops off like one over F. That's what an ideal zero picosecond rise time signal is gonna do. The amplitude is gonna drop off like one over F. But wait a minute. Those frequency components, the higher frequency components, they're gonna see more attenuation. They're gonna get attenuated more than the low frequency components. And so I'm gonna take a square wave with really, with frequency components that are dropping off like one over F. I'm gonna take that square wave and I'm gonna cut out all the high frequencies. They're gonna get attenuated away. What am I left with? If I take a square wave and I take out the high frequencies, what am I left with? I'm left with a longer rise time signal. The rise time is affected because I've removed some of the high frequencies. I've attenuated the high frequency more than the low. And so if I take that channel that I just showed you with that uh, frequency drop off of attenuation and I send a fast edge in it, the high frequencies get attenuated more than the low frequencies, I end up with a longer rise time signal. And it's got this funny kind of behavior. It's not a Gaussian edge, it's not a, a single pole response. It's a more complicated response. But we're gonna see, uh, uh, we're gonna see this longer rise time. That means when I send my fast signal through this lossy interconnect, frequency dependent loss, I'm gonna see a higher rise time. If my unit interval, the time for one bit, if my unit interval is is long compared to this rise time. Um, then it's a who cares? As my rise time is short compared to the unit interval, who cares? Uh, it turns on, my, my unit interval is long, and then whenever I'm ready to turn off the next bit, hey, I'm starting at the same place. But if my unit interval is short compared to that rise time, I'm not gonna have quite as much time. Be when I turn on, I'm gonna start turning on the rise time, but the bit's gonna finish, and I'm not gonna get to a, a high enough amplitude by the time the bit is there. That means how many bits I've gone, whether one or two or three consecutive ones or zeros, influences what voltage I have in that bit. And that's when we have information from one bit that leaks into the next bit, we call that intersymbol interference, and it's all due to rise time degradation. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. Um, so someone's asking, you know, I, you know, my problem is I'm showing these slides and I'm keeping them up for too long. And some of you guys that have very sharp eyes are picking up all these little details that I wanted, I didn't want to talk about. And Sid has a very sharp eye 
and he says, hey, what's this purple waveform here that I see? Okay, the, the teal color is the insertion loss, this is, or the transmission coefficient, tell us about the loss. The teal is the reflected signal. And it sees really small, that says I can ignore it, it's not affecting the insertion loss. So that's to be complete, that's the return loss in here. Okay, the impact of the frequency dependent loss is rise time degradation. And here is how that rise time degradation causes all the problems with high speed interconnects. Remember, it's frequency dependent loss means high frequencies get attenuated more than low. That means I send a fast edge in, I take out the high frequencies, I get rise time degradation, and that's gonna produce jitter. And here's how it does it. First, we're gonna look at some single bit responses. We're gonna look at a, a zero to one bit transitions. Here's a bit pattern we're gonna send in. A bunch of ones, this is all NRZ. A bunch of ones, a zero, a one, and a bunch of zeros. And then we're gonna make it a bunch of zeros and a zero and one. Okay, so two different data patterns. And we're gonna pay attention to the zero to one bit transition. And this example here is a five gigabit, but just as an example. Five gigabit unit interval is 200 picoseconds. In this example, I'm gonna use a 50 picosecond rise time. But the rise time is really short compared to the unit interval. And so I have plenty of time during that, at, during that bit interval in order to reach equilibrium. And so here's what that, that data pattern looks like. I have a bunch of zeros, and here's my zero one bit transition. I have a bunch of ones, and here's my zero to one bit transition. And the rise time is really short compared to the unit interval. And so whether I have a bunch of ones, and then the zero to one, or a bunch of zeros, look, I'm starting from exactly the same place. There is no jitter, right? They're right on top of each other. But now I throw in a real interconnect. So I got the signal going through the real interconnect, and what do you see? Well, here's what the bunch of zeros look like. Zero, zero. Here's a zero to one bit transition. I'm starting from down here. I have that long rise time. Here's the unit intervals over. I'm starting to come down again. And so here's when I cross that zero threshold, the, the sensing threshold for the receiver. And now if I send in that same signal, I have a bunch of ones, one, 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 and now I have a single zero and zero to one bit transition. In that single bit transition, I don't have enough time to come all the way down to the starting place. That's that's the next couple bits. I don't have time in that single bit to go all the way down. I'm starting my zero to one bit, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm starting my zero to one bit transition from a higher voltage level. And now I'm starting my zero to one bit transition. I get a head start. That means I go through the zero threshold for the receiver earlier than if I had a bunch of zeros. This is the fundamental mechanism by which frequency dependent loss, rise time degradation, causes jitter. And it depends on the pattern. If I have a bunch of zeros and a zero to one, or a bunch of ones and a zero to one bit transition, I'm gonna get that head start. If I started with a bunch of ones and I go down, I don't have enough time to get all the way down. And so every combination of zeros and ones is gonna get me somewhere in between these two and it's gonna be somewhere in between here. It's not much jitter in this case, but now we put it through a 40 inch long interconnect. And now we have a longer rise time to it. And so here's what a bunch of zeros and a zero to one bit transition is. Here's a bunch of ones and a zero to one bit transition. And look, we got a big head start when we had a bunch of ones. And so we're gonna cross that threshold a lot earlier than if we had a bunch of zeros. And it's this range in which all the different possible combinations of ones and zeros is gonna fall between. It is bounded, it's finite, uh, and depending on all the ones and zeros is gonna be the the actual arrival time, the jitter is gonna be somewhere in between here. And so we see that it's the frequency dependent loss that causes rise time degradation. And when that unit interval is small or short compared to that rise time, that rise time degradation gives rise to jitter. And because this is dependent on the data pattern, we sometimes call it data dependent jitter. And because it's all about ISI, that is one bit interferes or leaks to the next bit, we sometimes call it ISI jitter as well. This is the, the mechanism by which frequency internet loss contributes to jitter and collapse of the I. Here's the impact of it. This is the so what. what how's that gonna hurt us? And, and now comes this question. Someone asked it earlier and, um, uh, and, and um, 
uh, and, and this is really the heart of understanding how much insertion loss is too much, uh, because it's really a question of how much loss is too much. But wait a minute, the insertion loss is frequency dependent. What frequency do we care about? What's that figure of merit that we're going to use? And and when you when you uh, uh, and and so we're going to look at uh, when we send a signal in, we're going to look at the impact of the channel. This is that insertion loss of the channel on the signal that's coming out. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our channel we measured. Here's that insertion loss versus frequency or transmission versus frequency. We're going to synthesize in orange here is a PRBS signal. And we're gonna send that through this channel. And remember, the, the high frequencies are gonna be attenuated more than the low frequencies. And so that nice fast edge data pattern, the edges are gonna be rolled off with long rise time compared to the interval. And we're gonna end up with a signal coming out that is distorted and that's in red. And we're gonna take that signal at the receiver. We're gonna slice and dice it, recover the clock, slice and dice superheroes, and we're gonna end up with the I. That's the process we're going to look at. And now, what frequency do we care about? Well, here is a data pattern. In this particular case, this is five gigabits per second. And at five gigabits, that means five gazillion bits per second. And here is the bit pattern. Let's look, look at this region over here. Here's a zero, here's a one, here's a zero, here's a one. Imagine if we just repeated that pattern. We'd have the highest transition rate, right? One, uh, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Here, of course, is two zeros. Here's like four ones, and here's another single zero. But if we had a zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, it would look like a square wave, right? There are two bits in each cycle of that square wave. Here's a one, I'm sorry, here's a zero, here's a one. Two bits in one cycle of that square wave. If we have a square wave, the frequency of that square wave with two bits per cycle, the frequency of the square wave is half the data rate. So if we have a five gigabit per second data pattern, the square wave that is kind of embedded in that data pattern, we have the maximum transition rate, the square wave would have a frequency of half the data rate of two and a half gigahertz. And we call that frequency where that, that equivalent square a square wave would be if we had that maximum um, uh, transition rate, that equivalent square wave frequency is half the data rate. We call that the Nyquist. And that's the first harmonic. That's where most of the energy is going to be. The higher frequency harmonics are going to be about the rise time. The lower frequencies are about the data pattern. And so we use the Nyquist frequency. If we, we look, the, the attenuation is frequency dependent. Which frequency do we pick the, the attenuation at? And the answer is the Nyquist. We look at, for a given data rate, five gigabits per second, we look at the Nyquist, half that is um, two and a half gigahertz. And what we use as a figure of merit to describe the attenuation of that channel is the attenuation at the Nyquist knowing it's frequency dependent and the attenuation is gonna drop linearly with frequency. We're making that assumption when we pick the Nyquist. So now we can ask the question, how much attenuation at the Nyquist is too much? Clearly, as we go up in frequency, our attenuation, as we go up in data rate, our attenuate, the Nyquist is gonna go up, the attenuation is gonna increase. At some point, we're gonna have so much drop, collapse in the vertical direction, and deterministic jitter that our eye is going to be unusable. And the question is, how much attenuation at the Nyquist is that? And we can explore that really easily um, with, um, uh, with our simulation. Now, let's see. So what would be the way to fix this mismatch here? Decrease the rise time, decrease. There is no mismatch to fix. It's a really low reflected signal. Uh, let's see, Vahid is asking why there is a transition right before 1.5 nanoseconds on the, uh, on the waveform. Let's see, 1.5 nanoseconds. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, it's a little confusing. The, the orange uh, uh, plot here of the data, this is the data going in, the red is the data coming out. They're not really correlated. There's a delay. This is you know, basically what we'd see with a real-time scope. There's a delay between the signal going in and the signal coming out. So don't expect them to be correlated like that. 
um, uh, that they're just two examples of two waveforms of what's going in in orange and what's coming out in red. And then we take the red, we recover the clock, we slice the dice, we generate the eye. And here it is at five gigabit. At five gigabit, let's see, the, the Nyquist is two and a half gigahertz. So let's see, here's two gigahertz. So here's two and a half gigahertz. The Nyquist is about five dB. Uh, the attenuation about 5 dB at um, the Nyquist. And so you look at this eye and say, you know what? That's not bad. It's, there's only a little bit of deterministic jitter, only a little bit of collapse. This is going to pass all specs. So 5 dB of attenuation of the Nyquist is not too much. Now let's look at, let's up the data rate. This is 5 gigabits per second. Let's go to 10 gigabits per second. So we're at 10 gigabits per second. So transition rate is a lot faster. The Nyquist is five gigahertz. We look at our attenuation in this channel, and that's what we're going through. And here's about five gigahertz. The attenuation is about, here's minus five, minus three, here's minus 10 dB. We're about minus 10 dB attenuation at the Nyquist. And here's what the eye looks like. And you can see, oh my gosh, we've got more rise time degradation. We've got more deterministic jitter, we've got more collapse. This is about the threshold of how much opening in the eye we need. Or, you know, given the unit interval, the, the crossover takes out the eye and whatever left is the opening. And this is about the max we can tolerate. If we try to go at a higher data rate, which means a higher Nyquist, which means a higher attenuation, which means more rise time degradation, which means more deterministic jitter, this is what it looks like. So here we are at 12 gigabits per second. So at 12 gigabits per second, the Nyquist, half that, that's six gigahertz. So we look over at six gigahertz, our attenuation is minus 12 dB. And at minus 12 dB attenuation, here's that uh, 12 gigabit per second. Oh my gosh, the, the crossovers, the, the jitter, the variation in arrival times is really large, larger than any spec will tolerate. The opening the eye just isn't large enough to use. This says, uh-oh, if I have more than minus 12 dB of attenuation at the Nyquist, well, the technical term for this situation is I'm screwed. I cannot use that eye. When I send a PRBS signal in there with, with no equalization, cannot get away with that channel. 12 dB attenuation at the Nyquist, too much. And in fact, if I go to 16 gigabits per second, here at six, or 16 gigabits per second, oh my gosh, it is so fast. The unit is so short compared to that rise time degradation. Look at, look at what the received signal looks like. Uh, I've, got, I've got some places where I don't even go below the zero crossing threshold. There is so much uh, attenuation, so much rise time degradation because of this frequency dependent loss and that long rise time. I have no opening at all in that. It's totally unusable with no equalization. And so this says that, gosh, you know, if I'm not, and I'm gonna show you what equalization is in a minute. If I don't use equalization, the highest data rate that I can send through this channel is 10 gigabits per second, where the Nyquist is minus 10 dB, the attenuation of the Nyquist minus 10 dB. That becomes our figure of merit. That says, if I want to know how much insertion loss is too much without using equalization, the most attenuation I can tolerate, the most insertion loss I can tolerate, minus 10 dB at the Nyquist. Now, you tell me what your data rate is. I'm going to tell you, okay, that's, I can't have more than minus 10 dB at that frequency, at the Nyquist frequency. That sets the limit to what I can use in my interconnect. This is without equalization. Now I'm gonna show you what the value of equalization is. Because remember what the root cause of this problem is. The root cause of the problem is the frequency dependent loss. And, and so really what, what we're doing is, I mean, we're looking at the frequency domain. We're starting out with that beautiful, wonderful signal, the nice square wave. If I look at the spectrum of a square wave, ideal square wave, I'm gonna find frequency components dropping off like one over F. So here's a log log scale. This is what the spectrum of a square wave looks like. And that square wave has zero picosecond rise time. The frequency amplitudes of the signal dropped off with frequency. This is what I wanna see at my receiver to see that very sharp rise time and to have the rise time short compared to the unit interval, no ISI, no data dependent jitter. 
this is what I want to preserve. But now I go through, so this is what I want to preserve, that 1 over F drop off in the frequency components of the signal. But now I send the signal through that gosh darn pesky interconnect and the interconnect attenuates. This is the attenuation versus frequency or the transmission coefficient. This says higher frequencies, I'm going to get less amplitude coming through. That beautiful, wonderful spectrum I had going in, when it goes through this kind of attenuation, the high frequencies get attenuated a lot more than the low frequencies. I get a distorted spectrum and that gives me the rise time degradation. That gives me the um, the the deterministic jitter and my limited high, how high frequency I can get through. That's the problem we want to solve. And we can solve that problem in a couple ways in the frequency domain. The first way is we can make the attenuation versus frequency flatter. Yeah, we'll still have attenuation, but remember what causes the rise time isn't attenuation, it's frequency dependent attenuation. If I can make that rise time flatter, if I can equalize the loss versus frequency, I won't have rise time degradation. And we have two ways of doing that. The first is, so I take my signal, nice, beautiful, wonderful square wave coming out, very fast edge. I send it through my channel that's got the frequency of that loss, but now I add a filter after it. I want a high pass filter. I want to have more signal coming out at higher frequency. I want to make a high pass filter. And we call this continuous time linear equalizer equalization. This is basically a high pass filter. So that high frequencies get more gain or, or more of it getting through and low frequencies get attenuated more. The combination at every frequency of the attenuation and the interconnect and the, the, the high pass of the filter is a flatter response. And that allows me to maintain that one over F behavior for the signal coming out. I preserve that 1 over F drop off in the frequency compass of the signal. I preserve that fast rise time. I don't have ISI deterministic jitter. That's one way of doing it. I equalize the response of the channel. Another way of doing it is I'm going to uh, adjust the spectrum of the signal. If I know I'm starting with this nice um, uh, one of ref drop off for the frequency comes as a signal, nice fast edge. And I know it's going to go through the channel and see all this attenuation at higher frequencies. If I add extra high frequency to that signal, we call that pre-emphasis. I add extra high frequency to the signal. I, I distort the spectrum. So if I were to look at that signal, look really crappy, but I've added extra high frequency to it. So that by the time that gets through my channel, I attenuate those high frequencies away again and I end up with this beautiful, wonderful one over F drop off, the nice fast rise time. And if I don't want to add high frequency, I take out low frequency. We call that de-emphasis. And so I end up with the same shape to that spectrum, just, you know, offset a little bit. I pre-distort the spectrum of that signal before I send it through the lossy channel. So the losses in the channel distort that pre-distorted signal and bring it back into a spectrum with a nice 1 over F drop off, nice rise time. These are two equalization methods that are commonly used. CTLE at the receiver, this is a form of feed forward equalization at the transmitter. There's a third one that kind of does the same thing at the receiver, decision feedback equalization. I'm going to show you the impact of it. So here is their, our PRBS signal. This is at eight gigabits per second, no equalization. I can get away with that eye. I've got about 10 dB of attenuation in this channel at the four gigahertz Nyquist frequency. I can get away with no equalization. But now I up that frequency to 28 gigabits per second, higher Nyquist, more attenuation, ah, I'm screwed. Cannot use that without equalization. And now, um, Here's, here's what that signal looks like. So here in, in teal is the signal going into the channel. In red is that signal coming out of that channel. And you can see, oh my gosh, there are some places where I don't even, my, my zero bit doesn't even go, go below the, the threshold level. And of course, that's why it's collapsed. Terrible. Cannot do it without equalization. And now I turn on equalization. And here's just an example of it. So teal is the signal going in, peer based signal going in. The red is what it looks like with no equalization. The blue is just turn on CTLE, just the, the high pass filter to linearize the interconnect. And hey, you know, I did a pretty good job. 
uh, it's better, not perfect. And now I turn on CTL at uh, the feed forward equalization, decision feedback equalization, and in blue is that resulting waveform. And darned if I don't open up the eye 20 gigabits per second. It is impossible to use typical interconnect systems without equalization in the 28 gigabit and even in 10 gigabit and above just because there is so much attenuation. But now that we know how much attenuation we can tolerate, so at, at um, let's see if I summarized it here. Yeah, so here's what we can do. Here's how much attenuation, how much insertion loss is too much. If I'm not using equalization, 10 dB at the Nyquist, that's it. If I'm using just CTLE, in other words, just that, that linear filter, then I can handle as much as 15 dB of insertion loss at the Nyquist. And I can recover the eye just using CTLE. And if I throw in feed forward equalization and decision feedback equalization, FFE and DFE, then just using reasonably good effort, what is basically in the KR 10G uh, base spec, I can, I can recover if I have as much as minus 25 dB of attenuation at the Nyquist. And if you look at the 28 gigabit specs, they say that if you get really, really, really good at CTLE, FFE, and DFE, if you've done everything else perfectly, in other words, no reflections, no coupling in or no energy loss from coupling out, and no mode conversion, so if you've done everything else perfectly, then using CTLE, FFE, and DFE, you can recover as much as 35 dB of attenuation at the Nyquist. So to answer that question, how much attenuation is too much, how much insertion loss is too much, there's the answer. Unfortunately, to implement equalization, you say, well, why not do it? It's free, right? It's just silicon. The cost in implementing equalization is higher power consumption. And sometimes devices are limited by how much power they can consume. And so you always want to reduce the insertion loss before you have to use equalization as much as you can. And that's about the interconnect. And there are only, only a couple knobs to do that. We just touched on the mechanism. We said, well, first off, shorter length. Shorter length, less attenuation, because the total attenuation always scales with length. But rarely do we have that luxury. So what else do you do? How do you reduce conductor loss? Wider traces. If you make the traces wider, you get a lower characteristic impedance. And so that says you want to go to as low a characteristic impedance as you can live for your specification. Always live at the lowest impedance because that will enable the widest lines. And then when you, you wanna use as thick a dielectric as you can because that'll allow you to use as wide a line given the impedance. And you wanna use as low a dielectric constant with as thick a dielectric with as low an impedance as you can tolerate. And that combination allows you to use a wider line and less uh, uh, coupled, uh, loosely coupled differential pairs because that allows you to use a wider line. Everything is about wider traces. That reduces the conductor loss. Using smoother copper is important not to reduce the loss, but to not increase it above what you get with smooth copper. And then the only other knob to tweak to address the uh, attenuation from the dielectric is the, di the, the dissipation factor of the laminate. And so lower dissipation factor as low as you can afford. That's it. Those are the only knobs to address insertion loss. Here's how much is too much, and here's how you decrease it from the uh, selection of materials and the geometry. Now, I want to leave you with one last message. You know, we talked about insertion loss, and I showed you a couple of examples. Here, I pulled a couple of examples of other systems that I measured. Here's the, okay, this is transmission coefficient versus frequency. All materials show this kind of behavior. And you'll notice some are better than others. This one is clearly better than these guys. This is better than this one, but this is best of all. If you had a choice of which interconnect you would want to use for your channel, wouldn't you want to choose this one? Well, it turns this one is a cable a coax cable. And that's the idea that actually, I think it was Joe Felstead, but almost 20 years ago, he had the idea of, you know, I can get lower attenuation in using a cable than I can traces on a circuit board. And so he said, why don't I build a circuit board based on coax cables? And that was his idea in silicon pipe almost 20 years ago. Um, he was just ahead of his time because look, a coax cable has a lot less attenuation than traces on a circuit board because of the wider, the larger perimeter in the coax and the lower dielectric loss in the polyethylene of the cable. And that is exactly the approach that a number of companies are moving toward today. Here's an example of a Molex uh, cabled backplane. This is an example of a Samtech 
cable backplane that are in production today. Why cable? That's because you can get a larger perimeter in the cable than you can on the circuit board, lower conductor loss, you can use lower loss dielectrics and cable technology is well established. The secret to engineer it then is the really good connectors uh, in, the, in the channel. So this is a glimpse of where uh, uh, technology is going, the 56 gigabit and above, starting to use this uh, flyover technology. And so with that, come up to my time, just gonna leave you again uh, with the, uh, our, our special offer. There's far more to talk about when it comes to um, insertion loss and about channels than I have the limited time here to talk about. But I just wanted to leave you with that quick answer of how much insertion loss is too much without equalization, 10 dB. And if you pull out all the stops with equalization, uh, the, the 20 gigabit um, specs are typically in the uh, 35 dB of attenuation at the Nyquist as the amount of attenuation that's acceptable, but then takes a lot of equalization. So with that, I see there are a couple of questions that I skipped over. I'm going to um, just go through that really quickly if I can. Uh, let's see, to what frequency we need to extract the S parameter results for insertion return loss? So general rule of thumb is, again, you got to know what's happening at the Nyquist. That's half the data rate. And if you want to get, you know, if you got short rise times, you got to get a couple times the Nyquist. So generally minimum of three times the Nyquist, preferably five times the Nyquist. So if you're at 10 gigabits per second, the Nyquist is five gigahertz. Three times that is 15 gigahertz. Five times that is um, five times five is 25 gigahertz. So that's the rule of thumb. Uh, and it's all about how much you can afford. Uh, when you get above 40 gigahertz, much more expensive equipment, much more expensive uh, connectors. So at least if you don't, if you can't get to the Nyquist, don't even play in the game. Uh, and you need at least three times the Nyquist, preferably five times the Nyquist. How do we improve the EH and EW as frequency increases? I have to apologize to Aaron. I'm not sure what EH and EW refers to. Sorry. Um, does the attenuation at the Nyquist change with the material? No. So the question is, you know, I said, how much attenuation in the Nyquist is too much? It's 10 dB with no equalization. Doesn't matter what the material is. Of course, the frequency at which we have 10 dB of attenuation depends on the length of the channel and it depends on what the material is. So a more lossy material, FR4 over Megtron 6, FR4 is gonna have that, you're gonna get to that 10 dB of attenuation at the same Nyquist frequency at a much shorter channel than uh, Megtron 6. And so Megtron 6, you're gonna go a lot farther to get 10 dB of attenuation at the Nyquist then if you're going through FR4. So that's where you have the trade-offs, but the total attenuation of the Nyquist, given that you know, linear frequency drop-off is the number that's important. Uh, why don't we use all-pass filter? Well, I'm not sure what all-pass filter is. All-pass kind of indicates it's the flat response. It doesn't gain anything for you. It's the frequency dependence of the channel. That's the real killer. That's what we're trying to equalize. Uh, let's see, last question here. Receiver CTLA waveforms describes AC gain and various DC gain versus frequency. How receiver applies variable DC gain with respect to data patterns? This is based on non-transient bit periods and transient bit periods. Okay, the example I showed of CTLE, that is a linear filter. How do you make a high pass? Hey, you put a capacitive uh, a blocking DC cap in there and uh, uh, the 50 ohms at the source. That's a simple high pass filter. That's all it takes. There are active versions of it as well, but it's really easy to make a high pass filter so that you attenuate more of the low frequency, you only let the high frequency through, and that equalizes the channel. If you add gain to it, you're putting power into it, you're heating, you're, you're dissipating energy in the, in the active uh, high pass filter, uh, but hey, you'll recover more of the energy uh, coming through that filter. But it's just a simple, uh, frequency dependent high pass filter. Uh, these data are based on FR4 type materials, correct? Thank you. Yes. The example I showed, this particular one, I use FR4 type, type material, but I get exactly the same shape. You know, this, this, here, okay, here's a Megtron 6. Here's the coax cable. It's the same shape. What's different is the slope. And, and it's still the same issue of what matters is the attenuation. Here's that minus 10 dB. And so, if we're going through this channel in teal or this channel in red uh, without equalization, the
the highest Nyquist we can get through the red channel is about four gigahertz, eight gigabits per second. The highest frequency we get through the teal channel here is minus 10 dB. Let's see, that's uh, seven gigahertz Nyquist. So that is 14 gigabits per second. So it's all about the total attenuation. How far we can go up to what frequency, that's about the choice of the materials. Okay, uh, these data, da, 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 I height, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for the clarification. So I height and I width. So let me go back to the question. How do we improve I height and high width as I width as frequency ranges? I width is all about the jitter, deterministic jitter, frequency dependent loss. Flatten the frequency dependent loss, reduce the I, I width. I height is about the attenuation. Again, add some gain to it, flatten the response, add gain, no collapse of the eye, and we'll have a great looking eye. But all this is based on, we gotta do everything else right. Look at how, how much variation there is in these channels that I measured. This is all because of reflections and coupling out due to uh, 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 coupling to other structures in the channel. And so that's why I said, you gotta do everything right first. You have to reduce the reflections, you have to reduce the uh, energy coupled out, you gotta reduce the mode conversion before you get to these limits of insertion loss. That's why, you know, as my buddy uh, Dave Dunham at Molex says, he says that 28 gigabits per second, everything matters because everything contributes to these four root causes. Okay, and um, let's see, with that, uh, what is the use of AC coupling cap? What value does it be? That's a different one. Okay, with that, uh, we've gone over a little bit. I know it's being recorded. I know Lucy's gonna get back to you guys with a link to the recording and to down download the slides. Um, again, uh, be sure to um, check out the Signal Integrity Academy. Use our promo code WEB20 to sign up for your free three month subscription. And with that, everybody, thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, and um, hey, look forward to seeing you uh, in person one of these days um, after we're able to get a little bit closer together. So thanks everybody. I'll turn it back to you, Lucy.